it was just bad luck. I was literally in the wrong place at the wrong time. This was in 2002, and I was living in Bogota. Colombia was seen as this big drug hot spot, and the United States had just decided to spend $3 billion on what was called Plan Colombia. They were going to pour money into Colombia, and they were going to cut cocaine usage in the United States. There was the Colombian government, there were several rebel groups, and then there was a paramilitary group. And they were all fighting each other over control of land, control of resources. And so at the time, it was a country in the middle of this incredibly violent flux of both killings and kidnappings. And one of the primary groups was this group called the FARC. They were quite well armed, and they were actually in control of the southern half of the country, which is where most of the cocaine was grown. As the U.S. began to pour money into fighting drugs, it inevitably spilled over into fighting the rebels. So a story came across the local news services in Colombia about a helicopter that had been shot down in southern Colombia during a mission to spray drugs. At the time, it was kind of a freewheeling environment in the south of Colombia. The Colombian government had kind of set aside this area for peace talks with the rebels. And there's no law, it's just complete anarchy. So my plan was I'd fly out of the rebel zone, I'd go to the nearest town where the crash had occurred, and I was just gonna drive around until I found the rebels. So we flew into San Vicente del Caguan, which was kind of the capital, a small, tiny, sweaty airport. Myself and my then assistant, a guy named Mauricio Hoyos, we took this long taxi cab drive to this small river port town. We just went down to the dock and began asking around. And there was this one older gentleman who said, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll take you guys. And so we hired him for the day and got in this canoe. We were just in like Amazon jungle and it was hot and sweaty and just forever to get there. We pulled in and we walked up this bluff and immediately realized that we had stumbled into a very big rebel camp. It stretched as far as I could see under the canopy. There was huts all around. There was hundreds of FARC soldiers running around. I immediately sensed that not only was this a very big camp, but that we had walked into something because there was a lot of activity going around. People were running around and moving things, and I wasn't really sure what was happening, but I I had a bad feeling. We immediately get stopped by a couple of armed guards who ask us what we want, and we say we want to interview the commander. And this very nervous-looking little guy comes up to us, who is some kind of senior official, and he's kind of angry and upset. And he says, what, what are you doing here? This is all in Spanish. And I'm explaining that I'm a reporter and that we're here to cover the drug war and this helicopter crash. And he looked at us and he said, you guys are now detainees. And I, I, I mean, I, I, I had no idea what you were supposed to do. Until this point, there had never been a case, at least in recent years, of an American journalist who'd been kidnapped by the rebels. And I was just terrified. So the FARC made money in two ways. They made money by, they called it taxing the cocaine crops. The Americans believed they actually were drug traffickers. But the other main way they made money was through kidnapping. And so they had decades of experience at kidnapping, and they knew that if you kidnapped somebody, the Colombian families of the victim wouldn't immediately empty the bank account to pay for the return. They would hold off a little. And they knew that if you held them about two years or so, the family would kind of have broken down by then, and they would have sold all their possessions and emptied the bank accounts and raised money. And that was kind of the maximum point of return. So the average kidnapping at that point in time lasted about two years. And those were two years that the kidnapping victim spent in the jungle, sometimes chained to trees, sometimes in chicken wire prisons. They often suffered from leishmaniasis, which is this flesh-eating disease carried by the flies in that part of Colombia. So I was thinking immediately, oh my God, I'm here for two years. They called up a squad of 14 and 15-year-old guys who had AK-47s. 
And then the commander turned around and he began shouting just a stream of Colombian swear words at the guy who had piloted the canoe. And that guy was just taken away. We thought he was gone, that he was going to be killed. I felt terrible because it's often the people who suffer the most when some American journalist parachutes into a foreign country are the locals who help them. They escorted us into another little canoe and took us upriver another hour. So by now I have no idea where I am. And we finally pull into this clearing. And the only thing I can see in this clearing is a hut. I looked at that and I said, oh man, that's a jail. Night began to fall and they told us to get inside the jail. A cow had wandered into this encampment. And I remember two of the soldiers chasing after this cow with sticks and they were all laughing and I just remember thinking, oh my God, these are like 14 year old kids and they have guns. And they light a fire. Mauricio, my assistant, asked them, well, how long are you gonna keep us here? And the guy goes, diez meses, años, you know, days, months, years. Up until this point, I'd been sort of compliant and calm and I mean, there's lots of thoughts going through my head and they were building and building and building. It occurred to me that, gosh, by the time I got out in two years that happened, I wouldn't have seen my, my wife or my kid for two years. Would my kid know me? Would, would my wife stick around? What would she do? I just didn't know. And I, I got incredibly angry and just seized by the sense that I had to flee. Began <laughs> hatching these schemes of if only I could get a, a reed and jump into that river and then swim underwater for a couple hundred yards, breathing out of that tube like in a Bugs Bunny cartoon, I would totally escape because there's no way those bolts would go underwater. Or I could just get in the jungle and live off of ants for four days and hike my way back up to civilization. Me being neither an outdoorsman nor having any clue of where I actually was. I have to get out, I have to get out now. There's no way to do that, I mean, I couldn't get out. I fucked up, you know, this is stupid, this wasn't worth it. They gave us a black plastic sheeting for the night to kind of protect from the mosquitoes, because by this time, there was bugs everywhere. I was thinking, oh great, so now I'm getting bitten by mosquitoes who may or may not have malaria, and flies who may or may not have leishmaniasis. That's awesome. And then the sun rising. And during this whole time, we kept telling them, you know, we're just journalists. Call, check our credentials out. They had radios, so they were talking back and forth in code. And then, late in the afternoon, very leisurely motoring up the river, comes this wooden speedboat with huge speakers on the back, blaring Vianato music, which is the Colombian folk music, and this very obviously important fart guy. And he gets out of the boat, and uh, he has a black beret on. Full camouflage outfit, 45 caliber pistol, bushy black mustache, and honest to God, he is cradling a small poodle in his arms, and he's petting it. And the poodle's name was Nino. And I remember thinking, this is Dr. Evil. And he comes walking up to me, and he speaks in very formal Spanish. And he says, I'm very sorry to have inconvenienced you. We, of course, are friends of the press. We are just needing to check out your credentials to verify your identity. And we hope this matter can be cleared up quite soon. I gave him my name, I worked for the Los Angeles Times. I showed him my press credential, <laughs> which I had actually made up myself, but it looked official. He then disappears down the river, maybe an hour or two later. He comes back up and says, okay, we've checked you out. Your credentials are fine. Please allow me to escort you back to your town. And we were like, oh, great, fabulous, that's awesome. So he takes us down river on this very nice boat, which actually can get a breeze going because it's actually going faster. And then he dropped us off at the main town. Immediately called my wife. She had no idea, obviously. And then I called my editor. And I kind of remember comically now not wanting to get scooped. I wasn't going to get scooped on my own kidnapping. And I felt like it was a huge event. So I immediately went out and banged out this story, which then like ran on A15 or something like that. The next day, we had to get on our way. And as we were leaving, the peace talks between the government and the rebels end. 
and the government announces it will invade the rebel zone and take back control like that day. And so I don't go home. I got to stay and cover the invasion of the peace zone. We're in the capital there. And sure enough, the rebels just start taking off, fleeing. And the Colombian army helicopters, you can hear them landing. In the center of the town, they took down the FARC flag and raised the Colombian flag. And so we spent the next two or three days doing stupid things like following the army out to these rebel camps. And uh, they're gone. The guerrillas melted back into the jungle. If I had still been captive when the peace zone fell, then I think I would have been in the jungle for a very long time. It would have been useful to have an American hostage. Two years is the average, but they had held some people for 10 years. So it was very lucky that I got out when I did. (laughs) 